A woman was cheated on by her husband and they separated. The husband went, went away with the new woman, but the ex-wife was still thinking and loving her husband. One day she thought to look for an answer to all the, the, her concern about the, the husband and she decided to open the Bible. She, she wanted to look to find an explanation and so she opened the Bible randomly and she opened the Bible in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 and she read this. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now remember friends, this is what can happen when we take one text out of context and we try to apply it to our condition, to our situation, to our lives without respecting the context where this text was written on. And so this is what we are going to study today. I promised last week that we will be uh, studying about the context and we will uh, consider some other um, elements that need to be considered when it comes to how to interpret the Bible, which is the, the title of this series, How to Interpret the Bible. But the video for today is entitled Language, Text, and Context. Language, text, and context. And so before we get into the study for, for today, I'd like us to pray one more time. Be, and this is just because we want to recognize that it's not our intellect, it's not our uh, preparation or education, it's simply our Lord. It's because of what God wants to reveal this, this, during this video, during this time, that we can receive understanding. So I want to invite you to, to pray with me as we ask Him um, as his blessing upon this study. Please join me as we pray. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, once again, we don't want to go into this study without you. I mean, after all, Father, we, we are studying about you. We want to understand more what you have inspired all these writers to write. And, and there is no way that we can come to, the, to, to that fulfillment if it, if it is not with your blessing. Father, please bless us and help us to get the new lesson for today, the, the tools that we need to have to understand this, your beautiful book. I want to pray, Father, just take a moment, take a few moments to pray for that person that is on the other side of this video. I pray, Lord, that you will bless that person in, in such a way that at the end of this video, the person will know that, that she or he has spent time with you. Bless us, Lord. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So the, the text for this study is found in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 26. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 26. I want you to open that, to open your Bibles and, and find that verse for yourself, but I'm going to read it too. So follow me, follow along, please, uh, the reading that I'm going to have. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 26. This is what the verse says. Take this book of the law, and put it beside the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. Why is this the memory verse? Why, why is this the central verse? Simply because this illustrates the importance of knowing who wrote this, um, to, to whom was this written, right? What, what was the context among, around this verse? Not only in the, in the chapter 31, but also in the situation, the lives that this, the audience of, for these, the first audience for these uh, text, uh, what, what kind of life were they, were they living at this moment? Why was this uh, commanded by the person that was writing this? All these elements will help us understand uh, the text in the best way. And that's why it's so important to study about these elements that we are going to be studying today. I want you to keep in mind, though, Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 26. Uh, we will get back to that. Let me tell you, God permitted, God permitted, we have to consider this. God permitted His Word to be persecuted for some time in the past. And this is according to Revelation chapter 11. However, in the end time, which is our time, God has permitted the Bible to be read by 95% of the earth's population. Don't you think that's amazing? 95% of, of people in this world um, can have access, can read this beautiful book that we have been studying together. The Bible societies 
have been essential for the translation and distribution of the scriptures. They are the ones that put the translations together. They are the ones that print the Bible, the Bible societies. And they have been then an, an essential instrument for the translation and the distribution of the scriptures. We can read the Bible in our mother tongue. That's the benefit, right? We can read it in our mother tongue today. But we should understand some basic basic concepts about its original language and context so we can understand its message better. Though we can read it in our own language, we can still, we have to still consider that the, the message originally wasn't written in the language we're speaking today, for example. So for that, we need to consider certain um, uh, elements that I want to discuss it with you uh, during this video. Number one is language. We need to know about language and the languages that were used to, uh, to use to write this beautiful book. Number two, words. When it comes to languages, we have to talk about words and we will talk about words here in this study. Number three, uh, we will talk about um, literary um, um, way of writing and that is uh, a tool of writing and, and in this case we will study about repetition. What is repetition and why we find uh, re repetition in the Bible as well. And then we will also talk about context which is what we have been waiting for. Why is, what is the big deal about context and, and why is this so important when it comes to interpreting the Bible. And the last one is the authorship. The, the authorship is very important because who wrote uh, the book will tell us, uh, will give us certain elements that we need to uh, come up with good interpretation. So let's just start. Let's go to language. Language. Why is language important? Why to consider the language that uh, certain testament or certain passage or certain uh, text uh, that we're trying to study or interpret um, was written on will give us a lot of elements that we need to uh, understand the passage in the, in the best way. So for that, I want to take you to Acts chapter 26 and verse 14. Acts chapter 26 and verse 14. And this is uh, the, the verse found in verse 14. And when we all have fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the wood. It is hard to kick uh, for for you to kick against the the uh, the woods. So now think about this this verse. This this was written by Paul. This is the experience that Paul had when he was persecuting the Christians. He was going to kill. To he was persecuting them. He was incarcerating them. He was killing them. Kiss, killing those that are professing Christ as their savior. He was killing them. And so. While he was going on the way to kill a big number of Christians, Jesus meets him. And Jesus meets him at this point, and this is the experience that he's, he's telling us in Acts 16, 26 and verse 14. And so it's important to see what is happening for us to understand, understand one text. And so this is what Jesus says. Remember again, um, Paul was persecuting. At this, at this time, his name was Saul, actually. Later on, his name will be changed to Paul. But at this point, his name was Saul. So Saul was persecuting Christians, and Jesus comes to him and says, Why are you persecuting Christians? No, he doesn't say that. He says, Why are you persecuting me? And this just gives me, gives me the chills because I, I, I can just think, uh, I, I can just understand that my, my Lord, my God, when, when somebody attacks me, he feels like somebody's attacking him. And that's why the Lord says, that's why the Lord says that the battle is not ours, it's his. It's because when somebody goes against a child of God, it's like going to God himself. The battle is not yours, friends. Whatever you're going through, remember, the battle is not yours, it's his. But the question here is, why did God want the Bible to be written? Why would God allow this to happen? Why did God want the Bible to be written? I'm going to give you at least three reasons why uh, we believe the Bible was allowed to be written by God. Number one is so that uh, it can testify uh, of his work through history. Okay, so, so when we read the Bible, the written way, the written form, we are getting history of what God has done in the past. Number two, so that we can make, so that we can know um, the plan of salvation. 
So number one, to testify of his work through history. Number two, so that we can understand the plan of salvation. We can know about the plan of salvation. This is, this is what the Bible is actually about. Yes, it has history. It has, it has prophecy. It has some science. Yes, it has poetry. But beyond that, friends, the plan of salvation is why the Bible was written. Because the plan of salvation tells us uh, of a problem that we have, and the plan of salva salvation tells us of the solution of that problem given by God. And so that's why, that's one of the reasons, and I would say the most important of all, of, 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 for why we have this, uh, the Bible in a written form. Number three, the last one. So to teach us, so this was, uh, God allowed this to be written so that um, we can learn. So to teach us to act with justice so number one what god did in the past number two what god is doing now did in the past doing now will do so that is called the plan of salvation and number three so that while we went into the final fulfillment of the plan of salvation which is eternal life you and i can live with justice or injustice right so we can be transformed here and now and show to the world what god is able to do for his people, those who submit, those who surrender to the Lord. So God had, God, God chose a people and told them the truth in their language. At that time in the Old Testament was Hebrew, right? The books that were written from the exile in Babylon include some sections in Aramaic, and we know that. And because Aramaic was the original, the, I mean, the universal language of that time. So God, God used that language that everyone uh, spoke at that time or understood at that time or most of people understood at, at that time so that more people can be reached by the gospel. The New Testament was written in common Greek or Koine Greek, which er every, everybody could understand at that time. So God used Hebrew because people, his people used Hebrew, but he used Aramaic because it was the, the known language, universally known language at that point. But when it comes to the New Testament, the language is Greek. And so Greek was the universal language at this point, and God used that language so more people can be reached. Today, our time, your time, my time, there are translations of the Bible that allows us to understand the Bible. So we can put its principles into practice. That's why we understand this, this book. But though we have these translations in our own languages, like this one is a New King James Version, it's an English Version, but though we have these in our own languages, or languages that we can read, we can understand, still we have to, we have to consider the original languages because the original language will enrich our study of the Word of God. And that brings us to what the, the languages are made of. Words. Words. And for that, I want to take you to Psalm 63 and verse 3. Psalm 63 and verse 3. This is what the Psalm says. Because your loving kindness, pay attention to that word. We will come back to that word. Because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Why will my lips praise you? Why is the Psalm saying that his lips will praise you? God, because of God's loving kindness. Now, that kindness word comes from a, a, a specific Hebrew word, and we will come to that. But as, as in any other language, there are words in Hebrew and Greek that have several meanings or transmit diverse concepts or, 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 or meanings. For example, let me give you a couple of examples. Number one, uh, example number one. Uh, this word kindness that is found in uh, Psalm 63 and verse 3 comes from the Hebrew word chesed. Chesed. You have to make that noise to make the, the, the word chesed. Right? That's the word that they, they, you will find if you go to a dictionary uh, or a concordance, you will find the word translated into kindness. What is interesting is that that word kindness is not the only word in English that is used to translate the word chesed in the Hebrew. These are the words that you will find all around the Bible that come from one Hebrew word, chesed. Chesed, therefore, can be translated into grace in the Bible, goodness, kindness, mercy, piety, favor, righteousness, graciousness, compassion. So you can see just one word has different words that can enrich your understanding of the language. In this case, Hebrew, Greek, and so on. 
Now, there is another word that is very common that you will understand that you, I'm pretty sure you have heard. The word is shalom. Shalom. Now, shalom is very, very well known. It's one of the most popular Hebrew words in the world. But shalom, this word, uh, typically translated into peace in the Bible, has different meanings. Shalom can mean peace between two parties, two people. But it can also mean, shalom can mean inner peace, your peace. can also mean serenity, tranquility, wholeness, completeness, well-being. The same word shalom can mean all these uh, different concepts that I already shared with you. There are also different words that are translated by only one word in, in our language. For example, we have the word remnant. But do you know that there are different words in Hebrew and also in Greek that are, that are used to translate that one word? So all these different words, uh, and, and, for, and for the word remnant, we can find at least six of those Hebrew words that are translated simply into the word remnant. Another uh, common word that is one word in the English that comes from different Greek and Hebrew words and Hebrew words will be the word love. We have love from different he uh, Greek and Hebrew words, but it still is translated into one word. So that, that is something that we need to um, um, take it into account when it comes to interpreting the Bible, the beauty of the Hebrew, the Greek words. Um, don't get scared about this. You don't need to learn, um, you don't need to learn um, Hebrew or Greek to interpret the Bible. That's why we have different tools that we will see later um, that I already mentioned, a couple of those dictionary concordances and so on that we can use to, um, uh, to come up with a, a sound doctrine or a sound teaching. The important, the important point here is that the richness of the language enables us to better understand the message. God has sent, that message that God has sent through the Bible. That's why we need, we need to recognize the language that is not the same as ours, different context, different culture. This language it, um, has a different ways to express, express different messages. And so we need to consider that when it comes to interpreting the word. One of those styles of writing is called repetition. Repetition. So repetition is a way that the uh, uh, biblical authors use to uh, represent certain meaning of a text. And in this case, in the case of repetition, is to emphasize. But let me give you an example before I explain what the repetition is. A good example of this is found in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. This is what the Bible says. So God created man. Listen to the word created. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created. Number two, male and female, he created them. Number three, do you notice? Three times the word created is repeated. Three times. Why will he repeat the writer of Genesis? We know is Moses. Why will he repeat three times the same thought? Because, this is why. In our language, we may emphasize an idea by using exclamation points, boldface, uh, italics, or underlining or highlining the, the word we want to emphasize, or the phrase we want to emphasize. But in the Hebrew, is different in the Greek is different because there were these these elements were in non in non existence at this time. They didn't have commas. They didn't have points. Uh, they didn't have dots. They didn't use this in the sense of uh, uh, exclamation marks. They didn't have that. So they needed to. De they developed something different to make the same point to emphasize. The Bible authors use other ways to emphasize ideas. Then, one of these was. To repeat a word, like created, or in other example we find like in Isaiah chapter six in verse three, holy, right? Holy, 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 three times. When authors, this is something that to consider. When authors wanted to highlight a characteristic of God, they repeated the same word three times, holy, 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 and this is in reference to God. So it's to make an emphasis of the majesty of God in this case. Another example of that, of this uh, repetition um, uh, tool is found in Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 4. So I gave you three examples. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, um, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3, and Jeremiah chapter uh, 7 and verse 4. 
Another good, good example is, is found in uh, the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel emphasizes how Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar challenged God by repeating 10 times that he built, um, he built a statue. Three times. So you will find this in Daniel chapter 3. In verses 1, in verses 2, in verses, in verses 3, th uh, two times, in verse 5, 7, 12, 14, 18. Every time he would say that Nebuchadnezzar uh, built this statue three uh, 10 times in one chapter. Why? Because it, 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 the author wanted to emphasize the rebellion that uh, this pagan king uh, had against God. So that's what repetition is so important. And you will find this... this uh, uh, tool everywhere in the Bible also. We have to consider that when it comes to study, to the interpretation of the Bible. But this is the one that I promised last week, and this is the one that we will dedicate a little more time as we come to, to uh, the, the last part of this video. Context. Context. Now, let me take you to the verse so that uh, we will know how to understand this, this context um, this context uh, element. And remember that an, an, an illustration of this was given in the beginning of this video. This woman was, was trying to explain what the husband was saying and she went to um, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 and she thought that what was written there was explaining the condition of her husband. Enmity. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a total violation of the text. It's taking one text out of context. And somebody says that taking a text without context is, is simply a pretext. A text without context is a pretext. It's, I don't know who said it, who said it, but it's full of, of wisdom. A context, a text without context is simply a pretext. To take a text out of the context and try to and try to make a lesson out of that text is simply violate the way the text, the, the, the real meaning of the text. We are not to do that, and instead we are to consider and respect the context where the text is written on. So, again, Genesis chapter 5 and verse 2. This is, this is the verse for this, an example for this context. Another one, because I already gave you one in the beginning of this text, uh, this video. Um, excuse me. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 2. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 2. This is what the text says. He created them, talking about God, male and female, and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. Now, he is God, and the word created in Hebrew is only used um, when God is the subject. Because only God can do this kind of creation from nothing, create this way. He created them male and female. So he's not only, Moses is not only describing uh, one of the couple, but both of them uh, in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 2. He's recalling what happened in Genesis chapter 1 and G Genesis chapter 2. So God created them male and female, both of them, and blessed both of them and called to both of them mankind. Now, when you read the word mankind, you say, okay, what is the big deal? The word mankind has a special word from the Hebrew. We will come there. So in addition to understanding the meaning of the original words, the language, the original uh, words, which is important, the repetition tool that I, we already uh, discussed, we should also, in addition to this, we should also understand how they are used, these words are used in their literary and historical context. This is important. A good example is Genesis chapter 5, verse 2. And the word for mankind in the Hebrew is the word Adam or Adam. The word Adam, you know where that comes from, where, where, where we find that word in, in the Bible, right? Adam. The word Adam in the, in the, in the Hebrew uh, is translated into Adam in, in English. So in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 2, a direct translation of the word Adam is Adam is actually Adam. So this is how the text will read. It will translate it in, in, the, in a direct way. He created them, male and female, and blessed them and called them Adam in the day they were created. So you can see. You can see that this word Adam, this word Adam, the, the name of Adam can be Adam one, at one point and can mean uh, mankind or humanity in another one. So, for example, we already saw five, Genesis chapter 5, verse 3. The word, Hebrew word Adam there describes the name of the male 
creation of God, the male, the human male, uh, male uh, human creation of God, Adam. You can find also in Genesis chapter two and verse twenty-three this this one, and in Genesis chapter five and verse two, like the example, and Genesis chapter one and verse twenty-seven, Adam means mankind, humanity. The same Hebrew, but the context defines that is not only when is talking about the man of the couple, the first couple. Or, or the first man, or describing both of them as a mankind, humankind, human beings. So the context is essential to correctly interpret the message in each verse. It's essential. The moment, I, I will not get tired of saying this, friends, because this is done too often, too often, <laughs> too often in what we in what uh, in what we call um, biblical interpretation. People will take one text. And they will ignore what is before and what is after just to find evidence of what they believe. See, friends, the moment you bring with your preconceptions, pre, uh, sup suppositions, we studied this last week, to impose that into the Bible, the result will be, uh, will be a, a disaster. So we need to be careful with that. We don't come to impose what we want to believe in the Bible. We allow the text to tell us what we are to believe. So the, the context is essential to do that. It's very essential. So another element is what is uh, what uh, when it comes to who wrote that specific book, where the text is. And for that, I'm going to take you to Amos chapter 1 and verse 1. This is an example for that. Amos chapter 1 and verse 1. Amos was one of the minor prophets that also is in the canon, in the biblical canon, that we need to, we need to go for this authorship that authorship that I said we will study today, authorship. So the words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Do you see all the information that Amos chapter 1 and verse 1 gives us? All these details, all these context, historical context, what the situation that these people were living in, just like Deuteronomy chapter 31, right? We will come back to that. But just in the way Amos is describing all this, he's telling you this for a reason. When you receive details in the Bible, like in the Gospel of John, uh, uh, you will see this det detail, that detail. It was a lad in the case of John chapter 6. It was a lad. It was fish. It was bread. All these details have a reason to exist. The Lord uh, inspired the writers to keep those details there in writing so that when you come to read, you will understand more uh, or in a better way what the text is all about. So the details are very important. In Amos chapter 1 and verse 1, we can better understand the message of the Bible if we know details and background. Just to emphasize this, the importance of, of the, the authorship and the, and the details and, and the situation happening around the writers that we already saw that were several and several ages and several styles. We know who wrote many of the books of the Bible. We studied about this in a previous video. And even the date when it was written. Amos is a good example of that, right? All the, day, the information is given there in verse 1. And that information given in verse 1 of chapter 1 will not only influence or um, enrich our interpretation of whichever text is in chapter 1, but in the whole book of Amos. That's why this, import, this, this information is given. Um, we know the name of this, this, the authors, most of them, the dates and all that, but, but sometimes this information is not available through the Bible. But thanks to the Judeo-Christian tradition, we can get that information. These are, these are books that were written or letters that were written by people that lived at the same time that the, that the apostles or the original writers, biblical writers lived. So, uh, thanks to that information, we can say, okay, so this is written by this person, and this is the, the date or uh, the years where this was written, and we, we may understand the context, the historical context, the background details that will enrich the way we understand the Bible. So, in, in some cases, the historical context is especially, especially important. Like, let me give you an example of this. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse uh, 26. There we read an isolated verse, right? We say, uh, take this book of the law and put it beside the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be uh, there as a witness against you. 
If you read this verse just like that, you, you will not get anything out of this. But if you understand that Deuteronomy was written by Moses, you understand that Deuteronomy was, and you know who Moses was, right? You understand that, the, that Moses wrote this, Deuteronomy chapter 31, at the end of his life, right? When he was old, when he couldn't even move by himself, uh, he was getting ready to, to pass his leadership down to a different person, Joshua, that the Lord has uh, selected for this important task. And, and we can see this context. And one more information on the context to understand. Let me read it again. Take this book of the law. Now, we need to understand what the book of the law is. And for that, we need to go to Genesis. We need to understand what Exodus says. And, and then we will say, okay, this is how precious this book of the law is. And that's why it's been mentioned by this um, dying individual, Moses. And put it beside the Ark of the Covenant. We need to understand what the Ark of the Covenant is. And this is the details, the background that the Bible itself will give us. Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. We need to understand who this God is that he may be there as a witness against you. So, witness against you. Why will, why will a witness against uh, God's people will be necessary? God's people is the, the first audi audience of this, of this verse. So, all those details are important. Why uh, a, a witness against the God's people? And this is explained in the next verse. That's what context is all about. The next verse says, For I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. I know... For I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. If today, while I'm yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord, and so on. So, verse 27 will tell us. Verse 27 will tell us that that the reason why a, a witness against these people uh, was necessary is because of what they did in the past, who they were, and that's why we need to know who is receiving the message. Also, right? These were uh, God's people that, but they were rebellious all the time. And so Moses thought, okay, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give a protection for them to know when they are going too far away. And that is what he's saying to be uh, placed beside beside the Ark of the Covenant. So you see the con the the the, the, the uh, context, the details, the background, what happened before the text, what happened after the text, what happened what happens in the whole chapter, what happens in the whole book, what happens in, the, in a book before, in a book after, in the whole Bible, will give you a more, much more informed um, uh, interpretation of the text you're working on. Right? So, we need to consider, in, addi in, addi in addition to authorship, to details, to background, to historical background, historical context, we need to also understand that the Bible was written in different in, dif with, in different styles. It's not just one style. So the Bible contains poetic, historical, prophetic, and epistolary books, and the Gospels, which is a different uh, style also. Each style should be read and interpreted in a different way. We cannot use the same tools, the same way of interpretation to, uh, for a historical book, a book that we do with a poetic book. When it comes to prophecy, we cannot interpret prophecy in the same way that we uh, uh, we study a, a, a epistle. So these are different different styles that need to be interpreted in a different way. And when it comes to interpreting the Bible, we need these friends. And why? Because when we do all this work, when we wrestle with the text, what we're doing, friends, is getting the best understanding of what God has for you and for me. The Bible was written in different ages by men who uh, deferred widely in rank and occupation and in mental and spiritual endowments. The books of the Bible present a wide contrast in style as well as diversity in the nature of the subjects unfolded. Different forms of expression are employed by different writers. Often the same truth is more strikingly presented by one than by another. And that's why we need to go here and go there. Go to one book, book and what, go to one, another chapter and read what this other writer says so that we can enrich our understanding of any given, um, any given topic that we want to study. A different aspect of the truth in each, uh, but a perfect harmony through all. When it comes to the truth, another, another uh, writer will give a, another angle, a different angle of that same truth. Not a different truth, 
Because Moses never contradicted any other of the writers of the Bible. Because John never contradicted any other of the, or never contradicts even today, because we are writing that today. They don't contradict each other, because remember, the Bible never contradicts itself. What they do, the writers, is that they give a different angle, a different aspect of the truth in each, in each one of them do that. And the truths thus revealed unity to form a perfect whole adapted to meet the wants of men in all the circumstances and experiences of life. And dear friends, this is what we have in our hands. This few beautiful book that was, that was a, a blessing from our God. Because when you come to this book, you dig, you submerge yourself into this book. What you're doing is you are reading the revelation of the God of the universe. And at the same time, you're understanding more why he loves you so much dear friend i once again encourage you to continue reading this powerful book please open his open these pages and allow the holy spirit the same spirit the same one that inspired each one of the 40 plus writers to talk to you to your mind to your brain so that you can understand what god has for you today May the Lord bless you and thank you for being with us today. We are going to pray before we say bye. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for one more opportunity to study together. Thank you, Lord, because you didn't send us to the world blind and without information for us to make right decisions. We understand, Lord, that this is the manual that you have given to us for us to live righteous lives. And we pray, Father, that as we open this book every day, and every time we will see your face. I pray, Father, for that person on the other side of this video. I ask you, Lord, for, for in the name of Jesus and, and for your plans for that person that you may, you may, open, you may open the understanding, her, her mind, his heart, so that this person will understand how much you love him, how much you love her. Bless us, Father, as we continue studying um, how to interpret this, your beautiful book. So at the end of the day, we will understand your plan for us, for each one of us, a little better. Thank you, Father. We bless your name and we thank you for giving us this privilege to study together. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you, friend. See you next time. Bye-bye.